My name is Jessa Boyer. I'm the Executive Office with Native Governance Center. Native Governance Center is a Native-led nonprofit organization that supports Indigenous changemakers and nations. We encourage you to learn more about our programming by visiting our website, nativegov.org, or by following us on our social media, NativeGov. I'm happy you have joined us today to learn about the, our, healing our, future, <laughs> healing our Future Indigenous Wealth Building for Seven Generations. We are so looking forward to hearing from our panelists today. They're all doing such healing work to create ecosystems and environments where our people can thrive. I'm also passionate today about today's topic because of the full spectrum of wealth building in our communities. There are a few housekeeping items before we get started with our content. I'd like to remind all of you to submit questions for our Q&A portion using the Q&A box on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook. We will transition to Q&A at 6.45 p.m. Central Time. This event is being closed captioned. You can turn on closed captioning if desired using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Finally, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Thank you to Anderson Realty for helping make this event possible. Lastly, I'd like to shout out the Native American owned firm development Sovereign Sovereign uh, to meet the unique financial services needs of the American nation tribes, tribal enterprises and tribal organizations for their support. And finally, thank you to API Group, a market leading business service provider of safety, specialty and industrial services for supporting our 2021 virtual event series. I'm going to present a slide share on healing our future. Give me one second. Pearl, can I take it over to you? Thank you. Thank you, Jessa. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our event this evening. And while those slides get pulled up, um, again, we'd like to um, express our excitement and gratitude for the panelists that are joining us this evening uh, to discuss Indigenous wealth building. Just a moment. Thank you for your patience. 
Here we go. We're going to start uh, just by giving a brief overview of what Indigenous wealth is so that we can have a, a common grounding of what we're, we're talking about this evening. So when we hear um, some of these words, uh, maybe we can have some really great discussion and some really great questions coming in through the chat box. Um, and then we'll follow up with a, a panel discussion after, after this short presentation. But when we hear the word wealth, we might not consider or think of indigenous wealth right away. Oftentimes when we hear wealth, we're thinking about um, Western capitalism, uh, you know, a lot of models that really do not share wealth. Uh, Western wealth models include um, extracting public resources for short-term economic boosts and don't really uh, create a lot of access to resources for Indigenous and BIPOC communities. When we hear Indigenous wealth, it's quite the opposite of Western wealth. Uh, when we hear Indigenous wealth, there's not really a word for wealth in our languages and our mother tongues. Oftentimes we have words that describe what it means to be wealthy, um, such as living in a good way or living life healthy, um, being a good person or relative or a human being. There's not really one way um, that sums up wealth because it's describing a reciprocal relationship. It's a lot of a deeper meaning or meaning than um, at, at the surface level of shared wealth. And today, maybe our, some of our panelists can speak more to um, that deeper meaning of indigenous wealth. But when we speak about it in this sense, we're talking about decolonizing what it means to be wealthy. We're revitalizing systems that do have a reciprocal relationship um, in building capacity across a community. When we have shared uh, resources and access to those resources, we have shared wealth. And that can be food, it can be language, it can be culture. There's a lot of different things we can think about, but we have the opportunity to restore the health of our communities and nations. So when it comes to building indigenous wealth, we have to think about some of these following ways of how that looks, developing and restoring during um, regenerative economies, think of like cooperatives and similar enterprises. It also includes creating sustainable and accessible food systems. So a lot of the work around food sovereignty, um, for example, that maybe you're familiar with, that's an example of indigenous wealth building. Uh, supporting indigenous entrepreneurship also, uh, there's some great indigenous entrepreneurs out there. Um, and we can maybe drop some of those in the comments later. And also this is reclaiming indigenous life ways to help communities thrive. And there's some best practices when it comes to building indigenous wealth. Some of these maybe you're familiar with or have heard of, but when we do this indigenous wealth building, we do have to think about, do the values reflect our own culture and life ways as indigenous people. Models should be future oriented. That means thinking beyond one generation. You know, are, is this model going to impact future generations and how does that look? What's the sustainability of this model we're building? It also means you might have to educate some of the people in your community and also non-members of your, you know, members not from your community about how this model and system works. Because when we build indigenous wealth, there are pieces that impact our community members and those outside of the community. So getting everyone educated on the same page is sort of a best practice around building indigenous wealth. And wealth builders should invest resources into cultural and language revitalization. We've got a couple of those on on here with us today. So I'm excited for um, their discussion. If you learned something a little bit more about indigenous wealth today, feel free to 
drop a donation to Native people or organizations for their time. And better yet, make a recurring monthly donation. It is Indigenous Peoples Day today, and we are Indigenous also every single day of the uh, rest of the year. So I encourage you to think about recurring donations. And it's now my great honor to introduce our moderator for today's panel, and also to welcome our newly selected Cohort 12 Rebuilder, Jennifer. And I will let you introduce and share more about yourself. Thank you so much, everyone. Take it away, Jennifer. Thank you, Pearl. And thank you to the Native Governance Center for hosting tonight. This is really awesome to be. Uh, I feel very lucky and honored to be a part of this evening's event, um, Healing Our Future Indigenous Wealth Building for Seven Generations. Happy Indigenous, um, Indigenous Day, everybody. I hope you had a great day. I hope you were spending time with your family, spending time being Indigenous somewhere or supporting Indigenous celebrations. Um, I feel lucky and honored to be here tonight. Uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. That's where I'm from. I am a single mom to a three-year-old daughter. Her name is Maria. She is the light of my life and she drives me crazy all at the same time. So um, I'm really honored again to be here tonight. And I think I'll just hop right in because we have a great panel, um, a panel of smart, talented, but mostly committed and dedicated folks to their community, um, to the work that they're doing, um, definitely building indigenous wealth. But I would say going beyond that and also you know, uh, revitalizing language, revitalizing our culture, connections to one another, really awesome uh, group of people. And so I feel really happy to be here tonight. This is awesome. So um, we'll jump into our first panelist, um, Mr. Dallas Nelson. If you'll turn on your, um, your camera. Um, Dal, why don't you introduce yourself? I know you very well. We're from the same reservation, um, but tell the folks more about who you are, what you do, where you're from. Okay, thank you, Jen. Uh, Awesome. Thank you, Dell. Um, Dallas, tell us a little bit more about what brought you to teaching Lakota language immersion um, and why you're so passionate about it. Sure. Uh, for me, uh, I, I grew up here on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation here in South Dakota. I'm the director of our Lakota Language and Education Initiative at Thunder Valley CDC. And I what gravitated me towards the work that I'm doing now is uh, back in 2006, I was a part of um, uh, effort to build a regional, reg regional sustainable um, plan for development for our entire uh, reservation called Oyate Amiche. Uh, during that time, I, I was able to gain a snapshot of what was happening on our reservation in and around our reservation in terms of uh, the, the plight that we face as indigenous people, but also the cool and awesome work that our uh, community um, uh, champions throughout this reservation are doing. And one of the things that stuck out to me was our children uh, being able to go into each community on a reservation and seeing uh, our beautiful children 
um, have access to education, have access to different things. Um, it, it, for me, it reinforced that our front lines within, within indigenous uh, communities is uh, providing safe and, safe and happy places for our children. Um, so from that point, I've always worked in early childhood education, but seeing that uh, within our communities, seeing our children uh, struggle or not have those spaces in some cases, um, empowered me to want to create those spaces for for our, for our community. So um, I'm passionate about it only because it's uh, it's who we are as Lakota people. We are our language. We are um, our uh, life ways, our spirituality. Um, we're so fortunate here on the Pine Ridge Reservation to have a direct connection to that. I know within our communities um, throughout this uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, there are a ton of champions, ton of uh, leaders within our community that are um, empowering through our language and life ways. So uh, to see, hear our children speak our language, to hear our grandmothers speak our language, to hear ourselves speak our language is, is uh, for me, liberation. So. Uh, Dallas, tell me more about how you see the connection between the language immersion and indigenous health. What's that connection look like for you? So for me, uh, um, Indigenous wealth is, is, is our language and our life ways. Uh, indigenous wealth, um, uh, through, uh, it, meaning uh, as we revitalize, reclaim, restore, and then ultimately heal through our language and life ways, we are at the same time building indigenous wealth um, through, through our value system, our kinship system um, and um, value system, we, we work, we're working towards creating um, the system of uh, indigenous wealth where children, teenagers, adults, and our elders have, have places to be, be Lakota. For me, uh, our language is at the core of all of that. I, I firmly and strongly believe that indigenous education as a whole, no matter what community you live in, in, in the United States, no matter what indigenous community you live in, um, indigenous language is the future of indigenous education. Um, we, within our reservation, there's a, there's a few new uh, schools and people and communities that are putting our language first. And in return, building indigenous wealth through our language uh, uh, comes uh, healing, through our language comes building our self-identity, reconnecting to our uh, history, reconnecting to our uh, land, uh, reconnecting to our stars. Um, so for me, indigenous wealth uh, is our language, is, is the systems that we build from the language, whether it's a language nest, a elementary program, adult learner program, et cetera, these systems um, in return uh, continue to push, uh, push indigenous wealth within our community, build indigenous wealth within our community. Awesome. I'm just taking notes over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm chasing a flyer yeah, on right now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like healing, self-identity, history, <laughs> stars. I'm like awesome. So Dallas, I would say we. I mean, I wish I could say we were coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it feels like we're kind of in this second, third, fourth wave. Um, hopefully, you know, we're getting close to the to the end here. Um, has COVID-19 changed the way you view wealth? Has this whole pandemic, this whole experience? change the way you see see indigenous wealth at all? Well, for me, it's uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, I guess, amplified my, my perspective on um, what indigenous wealth is within our communities. For one, uh, COVID-19 has had a huge effect specifically within the Pine Ridge Reservation on our elder population. Mm -hmm. Our elders are uh, the knowledge keepers, uh, uh, lang first language speakers and thinkers, uh, the ones that are at the have been at the forefront since we've since this reservation was created. Our elders have been at the forefront of um, ensuring that we have access to our languages and life ways. So the the pandemic, of course, has uh, been very difficult for us within the, I'm sure all the indigenous communities because it's affected that elder population. So for me. Um, of it, it, it has amplified my perspective. Like, what what's important on our community? What are what are the most important things within our community? And I've been so fortunate enough within our reservation to see others um, uh, have that brought to light within their communities too. 
Uh, they've they've uh, created these systems where our Lakota uh, value system and kinship were, uh, were um, how can I say this, revitalized in a way where what's important, people, are, our, our grandmas and grandpas are leaving us, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is interrupting our daily work, our daily schedules, our daily life. So what's important um, and to see the community leaders within our reservation lean or come from our spirituality and our kinship systems and our value systems has really been an honor to see that. And for me, that's, that's our wealth. That's, uh, that's our indigenous wealth, our languages and the life ways, but us using our kinship and value systems to support each other, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, which has been very difficult. And like you mentioned, I mean, we're, we're like a third, fourth wave and uh, like post pandemic is slowly, like we see off in the future, but uh, right now it's uncertain. Um, so, but having the opportunity to work alongside people, witness people within my communities, put those value systems in place has been one of the greatest, um, I guess, uh, privileges within my community to, to, to witness. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I, I love seeing how people have come together in various ways to serve one another um, and help out. Um, so uh, to wrap us up, Dallas, I'm going to ask you one more final question, and then I'll move on to Danny. Um, Dallas, tell us, what can people do to support you in building Indigenous wealth? Uh, at the tribal level, I, I believe um, our indigenous wealth is how well we help, help each other, how our tribes help each other. So I encourage tribal leaders uh, with your, uh, within that role to um, share resources with others, learn how we best as a tribe can help, help each other. Um, it's, and it's happened and it's continuously happening throughout this pandemic, but that's one way people can support the, um, uh, on a tribal level. Uh, community level, um, support your language, uh, NEST, your school, your immersion programs, um, encourage individuals to be part of them, take part in them, uh, learn your language, uh, even if it's just one word a week or one word a day, take that step, that courageous step forward. Um, on a national level, foundations, donors, if there's any on the call, um, give to the movements happening within our communities. I, I like to highlight uh, um, when collective and better way foundation uh, both institutions, the foundations have, are setting the standard on how to give to uh, Indigenous communities. Um, and then more of a, on a personal level, uh, for like uh, relatives or friends that are on this, uh, um, in this discussion, uh, control our narrative, control your narrative within your community. A lot of the times we've, uh, part, of, part of Indigenous, indigenous wealth, our, our narrative is always controlled by outsiders. Um, we, we aren't a poor, pitiful, sad, broken people. We're a really powerful, strong, happy, vibrant, uh, beautiful um, group of uh, Indigenous people across the United States. So I encourage you to control that narrative, hold on to it, and come from a, a place of happiness and love whenever you're when you're when you're doing these things. So, Hapla Maela. Ilamaya Dallas, thank you. I love that. Control your narrative. And I totally agree. I think what we say about ourselves is powerful. So let's say good things. Let's say good things. All right. Um, Miss Danny Parados, would you turn your camera on and join us? I think Danny might have one of the coolest backgrounds. Like that's a real life lake. <laughs> Danny, okay. introduce yourself. Tell us where you're tuning in from tonight, the work you do, and who you work for. Sounds good. Bonjour. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Gishi Bagon and Gabuik Indigenous Kaz, Danny Paradis Indigenous Kaz, Makwa Nindodem, Unamani Zagigan and Dijaba. Uh, hello, I'm Danny Paradis. I am Bear Clan and I am hailing in from the Lake Vermilion Reservation in northeastern Minnesota, District 2 of the Boy Sport Band. Um, in our language, we call it Lake of the Sunset Glow, which is, I think, a lot prettier. But um, so I am uh, president of Harvest Nation, which is an indoor aeroponic farm. Um, it is still in the concept stage. I am really, really uh, privileged and honored and grateful um, to be part of this family owned business, 100% women owned, all enrolled members of the Boy Sport Band. And so this is really the brainchild of my mom, a brilliant woman, uh, Denise Paradis. Um, she was looking at um, the uh, 
impending energy prices and fossil fuel projections about 100 years in the future. And that really underscored the need for regional food security and alternative energy solutions. Um, she was looking at indoor agriculture because we live in northern Minnesota. It is very, very cold and growing um, in the winter, very, very hard and cumbersome, especially we have so many people um, to feed. And um, so my aunt, Tracy Dagan, she is going to be our farm production manager. And my sister, Nikki Paradis, she is our board treasurer. Um, so we are all family, we've got two sets of sisters. Some people ask, well, how does that go? Uh, it's like women own business and you're all family. You know, how do you work things out amongst yourselves? I always say we use bear clan negotiating when, you know, we need to make decisions. Um, and it's kind of nice, you know, I see our legacy as part of this overall, you know, we're, we're still doing what we've always done. We are becoming, again, producers and consumers of our own cycle. Um, when I was in college, I had my two boys. And what kept me from dropping out was a, a, a photo series of my mom's grandma who had her uncle on, um, well, my mom's uncle on her back in a Tikkanagan, a cradle board in one picture. And then in another picture, there was my mom's grandma working with my uncle or great uncle in the Tikkanagan um, posted up near her. So she still worked with her children. So shout out to all single moms out there. Um, it was very, very hard, but very much a privilege to have um, my boys with me and to have that legacy of, you know, our family. We were always, you know, we're all entrepreneurs, indigenous people. We had to do and know so much. Um, so I feel like indigenous wealth really comes, you know, it starts here and in our hearts. Um, and yes, just grateful. Um, so we are in the business of providing um, uh, local food access to fresh, healthy produce. So we're, we'll be growing fruits and veggies once we get up and running. Um, I'm really passionate about this work because I grew up in the food system, uh, so to speak, taking everything at face value, which when you do that, I got really, really sick. Um, I learned really bad bad, I guess, shouldn't be judgy, but, you know, maybe unhealthy eating habits. Um, and when my mom brought me onto the project, um, to the farm, uh, I, I had to really take a look at myself. I'm also a recovering alcoholic. And so I'm looking at my health through that perspective and this idea of like food addiction, alcohol addiction, and then it kind of spread out to like all of my other consumer addictions, material addictions addictions, you know, this, this feeling like I just need, need more and more. And as I dug into uh, food sovereignty research, I found um, a better way. And I just feel so privileged and so lucky to have, have access to this, um, this movement um, that I can share with friends and family and community around me. Um, so yes, I will pass it back to you, Jennifer. <laughs> Um, so you jumped into a little bit of what you all do at Harvest Nation. I know it's local access to fruits and veggies. Um, tell us more about your goals for the future. Maybe not the whole hundred years. <laughs> we have a amount of time. So maybe like the next five to 10 years, what are some of your goals? Uh, I know you talked about getting um, access into local food supply. What other goals do you have at Harvest Nation? Our first immediate goal is getting our first farm launched up on the Iron Range in northeastern Minnesota. Um, and I love the comment earlier about, you know, we, 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 you know, are educating ourselves and our communities, but then also kind of ripple effect our extended communities because our farm um, will serve our two reservations, Net Lake and Lake Vermilion, but then also this abundance that will come from growing indoors year round, we can also share with members of neighboring towns. Um, one really kind of tough part about that um, is, you know, having to be the token sometimes or all the times if you're the only person in the room. Um, and I know we talk about, you know, people should go out and self-educate, but just the reality is, you know, we are those people in those rooms a lot of times. And so I told my son, you know, if, if and when it happens, like you, I've heard this from another elder, like we are the ambassadors since we don't have a lot of numbers out there. Um, so I try to do my best to kind of do that whole networky thing, but it doesn't come very naturally to me as much. Um, but that education piece as to why, you know, it's important 
um, especially our values, especially post pandemic um, for us to um, share who we are because it, it's allowed us to survive multiple pandemics um, so far. So after our first farm, sorry, we are looking to launch farms wherever we're needed, um, anti-colonial model wherever we're welcomed. Um, and aeroponics is pretty cool because it can pretty much grow anything um, restricted by kind of size a little bit if we're growing indoors, so. Awesome, I love that anti-colonial model. <laughs> Um, so similar to Dallas, what does indigenous wealth mean to you and the work that you're doing? And you hit on this a little bit, but if you can also talk about how COVID-19 changed the way you view wealth. So what indigenous wealth means to you and the work that you do, and then how COVID-19 may have changed that view. So it even, yeah, before COVID-19, and then it was further reiterated with COVID-19, um, indigenous wealth for me, means that we are producers and consumers of our own cycles again. Um, where but just from our story, you know, we had multiple bands of people on Lake Vermilion. Um, it wasn't just, you know, boys for it. You know, it wasn't just Lake Vermilion Indians or whatever. It was bands and averaging maybe about 100 people. And at that size, you know, how much better can we take care of our community members um, so I see it as us rising up to take care of each other. I know a lot of our tribal governments have taken on so much weight and responsibility for our communities and they have brought us so far. Um, but I, I feel it's really time that we um, get further back into having more self-determination at the family level. And I see that done through small business development. Um, where we provide services to each other, bartering systems, all that good stuff. Um, and COVID-19, I have a story on that. So when Coop hit the fan and then the George Floyd um, uh, tragedy hit, you know, it almost seemed like all of our big supply chain systems and societal unrest, like everything could just kind of go kaput. Um, I was crying around <laughs> in front of one of my elders, like, oh, what are we gonna do? And um, she said, Dan, like, we're all set up, still going to be here. Like, <laughs> um, and that further, you know, put it to the level of we need local, local access to food, again, services, health, um, and just that really helped me kind of relax just a little bit, um, just knowing that we're still here to take care of each other, but that we have a responsibility with this knowledge now of pending energy crisis, climate change, and uh, pandemic that our, our people can step up and step in where the government um, might fail or not have the reach that we do in our own family hubs. Um, yeah. Awesome. Sometimes we need those elders to reel us back in, right? <laughs> yep. Um, why don't you take the next few minutes to tell us what people can do to support your work at Harvest Nation um, and your community in building Indigenous wealth? How can people support you guys? In whatever role you're in, and let's say you're even like, I was thinking about this, like what if someone is like an, like an insurance agent? Uh, like how could they you know, play a role in advocating for Indigenous wealth? Well, look at and see is your program um if you're in actually any state across the u.s or any place across turtle island are you serving indigenous people in a meaningful way and is there a reciprocal relationship let's say you're only serving one or let's say there's zero obviously you have outreach to do to make those connections but i mean one self-educate be informed you could read that beautiful book Decolon decolonizing wealth um seeing that on a couple tables, um, but then really doing, doing the hard work of getting Indigenous people to the table, the decision-making table, um, and on that point, be patient, please, um, and making space for folks that aren't, you know, all professional businessy looking all the time, that um, that's not required for good leadership, 100% of the time um, and that it really is about getting what those needs are and not worrying if someone you know came dressed to impress that day 
Um, I felt kind of shy in certain circles if I felt like I, you know, wasn't being taken seriously for how I um, talk or present myself. And I know that there's others in my other social circles that when they're advocating for themselves, even just at the clinic or at the local ER, that um, folks don't take what they're vocalizing seriously. So it doesn't matter what people look like, it doesn't matter what they sound like, just listen to the words they're saying and the needs that they're presenting and do your best to accommodate those. Thank you, Danny. Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, don't go anywhere though. We may have Q&A later. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Ms. Tasha Paltier. I'm lucky I get to um, serve with Tasha. We're both community, oh, what are we? What are we? Culture of health leaders <laughs> for Robert Wood Johnson. I'm like, what are we doing again? Um, so that's where I met Tasha. It's been great to know her in that sense. Um, Tasha, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from, the work that you're doing and the work that you're doing at Miniwichoni Health Circle. Awesome. Hamadak yapi, chante washte ihana pe chiuzapi, Tasha Peltier amachiapi. Hello, relatives. Um, my name is Tasha Peltier. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, um, I serve as co executive director of the Mini Wichoni Health Circle. I'm also Humpapa Lakota. I come from the Standing Rock Nation. Sorry if there's background noise. My neighbor decided to mow their lawn right at this second. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, we, we are an organization, a nonprofit organization that's really um, centered around promoting community health and wellness. Um, that's really true to who we are as Dakota and Lakota people, um, really looking at um, centering that on our values, our teachings, our way of life, um, our ceremonies. And so um, we're a fairly new organization, but um, and so we're, we're in the very beginning stages of, um, you know, planning and things like that. But so that's who I am. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we are um, part of the Culture of Health Leaders Program, C4. Woo, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I also, um, you know, my background is in um, public health. I have a master's in public health um, in American Indian public health. And so that's really what, um, you know, as I was in that graduate program that's really what sparked my interest in you know looking at health and wellness from an indigenous perspective um, and really trying to understand how we um, instead of centering it on a western view of you know health and wellness how do we center it on our own ways and so that's really been a lot of the work that we've been doing with our organization um can you tell us a little bit about your goals for the future for Minnewichoni? Sure. Um, so I suppose I should give a little bit more information. So, so our organization was also birthed out of the um, the, the No Dapple movement, the Okete Shakoi camp. That there was um, different organizations that were there providing services within camp. So um, things like you know herb, you know from herbs to um, you know and medicine, uh, traditional medicines to you know we had I know there were midwifery services that were offered there. Um, just a, a whole wide array of things that were were offered to the frontline um, people there. And so I think um, that really sparked kind of a motivation in a lot of people. And so when camp, you know, was done and people started to go home, this organization, we were still there. Um, I wasn't part of the organization at that time. I had just come onto the board, but basically we wanted to carry that on. What did that look like after, you know, everybody went home and what did that look like starting in Standing Rock? How do we carry out um, kind of this empowering feeling of we can take control of our own health and wellness. And so, um, you know, that then we transitioned a little bit and started to really connect with communities. So we met with, you know, elders and different community members to really ask them, what does health look like to you? What does that look like in our communities? Um, and really learned a lot. And um, so we were able to kind of narrow it down to some, um, I guess, domains for lack of a better word, but so really focusing on different areas one of the areas that we want to focus on is um, women's health, you know, understanding that that's a very important uh, monumental time for both the, the mother or the life giver and that um, baby. And so looking at diving into some, uh, reclaiming some of those practices. So looking at indigenous full spectrum birthing practices, you know, prenatal, postnatal, um, indigenous birth plans right now in Standing Rock, if you look at 
Um, what we have access, access to, our mothers don't have the options other than going to border communities to deliver their babies. And that's not always a good experience. And so really trying to look at how can we build our capacity locally to be able to, you know, if people want to do home births, you know, have babies at home, how do we help them to get there? If they want to take control of what that looks like in a hospital, empowering them and helping them to be ready to advocate for themselves to make sure that that experience is, is what they want it to look like. Um, and so that's, you know, we, there's a lot of other things we did in that realm. We're looking at, um, you know, offering or trying to, to do more of our um, coming of age ceremonies, really trying to help our young people um, and help them through those transitional phases of their life. Another area that we're focusing on is um, the Nagi Gluhapi. So looking at keeping of the soul, we know that we have a lot of, um, a lot of things that come up in our communities due to grief. Um, we've we've adopted unhealthy ways of grieving through colonization. You know we have drug drug use and alcohol use in our communities, and so um, you know looking at how did we traditionally um, uh, deal with things during that time. You know how did we come together as community? What ceremonies did we have to help people get through that? How did we view death? You know how did we you know we had an understanding that that time would come when we were prepared for that. Usually when we could be, and so how do we help families to be prepared? for that time in their lives or their loved ones' lives and help them transition. Um, another area that we're looking at is just ceremonies in general. So, um, you know, one of the things that we recognize, my co-executive director, Elena Eagleshield, and I both grew up kind of in the same um, ceremony circles and our, we went to the same ceremonies, you know, from when we were tiny little girls. And so recognize that we were really privileged. You know, our parents were really hard to ensure that we were connected to that way of life and that we, we received those teachings, we lived like that, but there's a lot of people because of, you know, colonization that are separated from that and don't have access to that information or don't know who to ask, you know, um, when they want to learn those things. And so we've been really working hard to um, try to meet people where they're at and, and hopefully create this network or, you know, create a space where people can seek that, um, seek those people out or those ceremonies. Um, and then the other area we look at is food sovereignty. You know, we heard a lot of really good information from Danny about how important that is. And we, I just echo all of that. You know, we, we need to be able to sustain ourselves. Um, we have a large land base, 2.3 million acres. And so, um, you know, it's about thinking about how much of that land is in use to contribute to our food systems and, you know, our communities. Are we, are we making the best use of that land? And then last, this is probably a more recent thing is just because Elena and I both have a background in public health is looking at public health infrastructure and how do we, you know, how do we look at um, the work that we're doing and really see if we're making a difference and how do we, you know, those are not the fun things to look at, but it's important as we work, move work forward. You, you're a fellow MPH here, so you know what I'm talking about too. So, um, you know, those are just important things to evaluate the work that we're doing. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, okay, so tonight's conversation is around Indigenous wealth. So tell us a little bit how Miniwichoni Health Circle is working to build Indigenous wealth. Well, I think, you know, really, um, and I feel like it's been mentioned a few times already, but, you know, knowledge is wealth, right? So carrying on, you know, the, the, um, the stories, the teachings that have been, you know, carried on through generations, that's wealth to us. You know, um, health is wealth you know, keep making sure that our communities are healthy, making sure that we're in control of our um, bodies, making sure that we're, you know, that's all indigenous wealth. And so those are things that we, you know, each of those kind of areas that I talked about, that's the intent behind that is to really take that back, to take that community health, community wellness, and to um, center it around our own perspectives and our own um, ways of thinking and being. Awesome. And I know um, just from our time together that we, you did a lot of work um, during COVID-19. I know you worked a lot with local public health, local um, IHS or Indian Health Service. Um, how has COVID-19 changed the way Miniwichoni views, um, views Indigenous wealth? And um, has COVID-19 you know, changed or have you changed the way you're doing work because of COVID-19 um, at Miniwichoni? 
Yeah. So I think, you know, um, the pandemic hit right when we were, we were hitting the ground running with our organization and starting to, you know, really look at planning and physical space and all that. And, and it just stopped us in our tracks because, you know, we had big plans of going and visiting other communities and learning because we know this is happening all over the, the United States and other parts of the world. And so, um, so yeah, that really stopped us in our tracks. But I think one of the things that we saw right away was, um, and I think Dallas mentioned it a little bit is that, you know, we were starting to uplift um, what we know as like, being a good relative, right? Taking care of each other. We started to see a lot of grassroots um, just action happening. You know, people were, you know, talking about our traditional medicines, you know, making teas and fire cider and all these things, you know, everybody was wanting to just do their, their part in making sure that they were keeping each other safe. We saw, um, we saw that our communities were really serious about protecting each other. So we, I think um, in indigenous communities, we saw people that were trying to adhere to the recommendations to the best that they could, you know, wearing our masks, you know, where sometimes in other communities, we weren't seeing that people were resistant. Um, and so I think we that really um, highlighted uh, our teachings, you know, that those things are inherent in us that we know that we have to think outside of ourselves and and really do what's best for the community. And so those were some things that we saw. And so we really tried to support um, some of those grassroots efforts. You know, we knew we couldn't go and do the things that we planned on doing, but we, we were, you know, trying to find ways through funders that we were connected with is how can we support these people buying, you know, getting the herbs that they need, getting the tools for them to make teas and make um, care packages for everybody. So a lot of the, um, that's really what we shifted our focus on was just being, we did, um, we got masks out to the communities. We made elder care packages to help them, you know, be able to have the things that they need so they didn't have to share items within the household, trying to help, you know, any way that we can, could, we got food out. So it did really shift us to kind of a crisis mode, but it was okay because that was what was needed. There was no way we were going to plan for the future when we were going through this pandemic. So, yeah. And then if you can, um, finish out, Tasha, just share with us how people can support your organization and in building Indigenous well. Um, so I think, first of all, you know, at the individual level, just really encouraging people to um, get out there and get involved. You know, I know we, we try to do things locally and virtually, so it's available to a lot of people, but we, we just want to be inviting to everybody that the things that we work on and things that we do, they're for everybody. You know, we want people to learn. Um, communities, same thing, you know, really um, encourage, and even if it's not with us, you know, but just encourage you to start um, really promoting our ways and our, you know, these kinds of things within our communities, whether it's to help um, with your programming or, you know, whatever you're doing in your community, whether it's in education, whether it's in, um, you know, po politics and tribal health, whatever that looks like, really encouraging you to uplift our, our ways and our values in the work that you do every day. Of course, um, you know, uh, funds are always helpful. That's the reality as much as we don't, you know, that's a colonized system and we, you know, but we, we need those things now to, to operate. And so, um, you know, whether that looks like supporting local people that are doing health work, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of grassroots people that try to just get stuff out to people. So support them, buy their teas, buy their medicines. Um, and then, you know, there's several ways that you can donate to like organizations like ours. Um, I think they have our website up there. There's a, a donate button there. Um, and it doesn't have to be funds partner. We, we always want to partner. So if you have ideas or you think, Hey, we could, this could be a good partner. We partner with people all the time because we know that, you know, we're not going to achieve things by ourselves. So we're always down to partner. So reach out to us. Um, if you got ideas, throw them our way too. We're always open to that. Awesome. Thank you. Well, this has been really great. We're going to step into our um, question and answer. I think we might have time for one or two questions. So I'll invite Danny and Dallas to go ahead and turn on your um, screens. I'm like, what do they call those? <laughs> and um, yeah, I was just reading, you know, I, I, I love being a part of these things. I learned so much and I take a bunch of notes. And I think like for me, the overall theme has been taking care of each other, helping each other, being a good relative, um, really showing up for one another. And so I wanted to um, really highlight that, that that's going to be one of the take home messages for myself. Um, and so one of our questions that 
came up was um, if one of one or all three of you can talk about what could be or what has been an example of a right relationship, collaboration, or partnership with a non-Indigenous organization um, who would like to be of support to your organization or your community. So what would that look like? And anybody can start with that answer. I'll start in on this just really quick. We partnered with a local private foundation um, to get a feasibility do study done and some prototyping. And I appreciated that partnership uh, better than like a state or federal grant because private foundations are less restricted. So they were a light touch, meaning we could focus on our community work um, that much more. I would totally echo that. I think the the most um, meaningful partnerships that we've had are less restrictive. They're really um, allowing us to do what we know works in our communities. Like you mentioned, the federal and state um, funding streams often have, you know, they want you to use evidence-based interventions. And, you know, we all know that those don't always work in our communities. We know what works in our communities. So having the flexibility to be able to do and not have to spend donut hours on reporting and, you know, all of this meaningless work to us then to be able to actually do the work, actually do the work is really helpful. I agree. Uh, same thing what Danny and Tasha said, the foundations, especially the private ones that um, the private foundations that allow you to do the work and believe in your mission uh, rather than coming from as outsiders and telling you what to do. Uh, those proud, uh, I mentioned a few, uh, One Collective and Better Way Foundation, those two are setting the standards with uh, uh, private foundations and how to support, believe in, and assist the Indigenous communities. Awesome. Yeah, flexibility, I think, is important sometimes with our um, with our funders and foundations. Um, things change, right? Things change in our communities. And in order for us to meet those needs and address those emerging issues, we definitely, definitely need partners that are willing to bend and flex with us. So we appreciate and always lift up those partners that work with us in that way. Um, okay. Let's talk about, um, have you dealt with lateral violence when trying to build wealth? If so, how have you worked to overcome that lateral violence? I use self, is this the right word? Self-deprecating humor. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best strategy, um, but if anybody, you know, if it, it does happen, um, and, and when it does, um, you know, it's an opportunity to, to you know, kind of use it as an educating moment um, by saying, hey, you know, we're all in this together. Here's, you know, why this works important to me. But then you just open yourself up to more. Um, so it's just been for myself, just easier to redirect and refocus back to my work. Um, you always have that sense of paranoia. I know other entrepreneurs in the community that are wondering about, you know, extended relatives or this person. And um, I always try to look at the source of that information. And um, if they're putting their hands to good work, then maybe they have a valuable comment for me. Um, if they're not, then um, I just will let it be. And I don't know if necessarily um, if we've experienced lateral, lateral oppression, but we really have a slower up, uptake, I guess, in our community, our own community. So because of COVID, we've had to take a lot of things virtual. And so we have a ton of people that are interested in our work from afar. And so getting, um, you know, into our own communities has been a little bit of a slower process. And I don't know if that's lateral oppression or if it's just that they're like, what are you guys? Or what are you actually doing? And so um, it's just taking a little bit more time. And so I, I'm, we're just being patient and I know that will come the more work that we do. So like I said, I don't know if I've actually, if, that, if I've experienced lateral oppression, but that's just something similar that we're experiencing. For me, it's uh, the best, best way that I've learned to deal with uh, other, uh, lateral oppression amongst their own people is to one, learn learn our history of our people. Was it just overnight that we uh, are the way we are amongst our communities? There was a systemic oppression, whether it was federal, uh, parochial, or, or uh, whatever type of non-Indian institute that um, oppressed us for over a century and still continues to oppress us. So 
understanding your history of your community and then helping others understand that too and being gentle with your relatives um being gentle with and with your relatives even though uh, sometimes uh they can they can be mean hateful and etc but it's it, it, we're all in this together so I love that. I love remembering that we're re we're relatives, right? So even if at the end of the day, like we have a hard conversation or someone's hating on the work, um, at the end of the day, those are our relatives, those are community members. And, you know, we might walk out of that meeting and see them at Big Bats. That's our local gas station here at Pine Ridge. So, you know, it, you got to remember that those are still our, our relatives, family, friends, that kind of thing. So, um, it's always good to approach them. I always, okay, I'm answering the question. I know you're not supposed to do this as a facilitator, but dealing with lateral oppression, it just, you know, I always looked at it like, this is just another opportunity to talk about the work, right? Like, you know, that to me was always like, even if it was um, being negative towards the work or the organization or why we were in this meeting or whatever, it was like, well, let me tell you, let me set straight what's going on here, right? So um, just another way to just Try to reframe it in your head so you're less defensive. It's more like, oh, they're wondering about the work. If even if it's critical, they're wondering about what's happening. So, um, I think at this time, I will thank um, all the panelists. We have about three minutes left. I'd like to thank again a Native Governance Center for allowing us this time. Thank you to Dallas, Danny, and Tasha for um, sharing your work with us, for sharing your time. And I wanna thank you for the work that you do do in our community, for all the work that you lift up um, and for going out there every day and um, teaching our kids language, growing food, um, revitalizing our ceremonies, um, really beautiful stuff. And thank you for sharing your time with us tonight. I'll turn it back over to the Native Governance Center um, staff and thank you guys for joining us this evening. Miigwech, Jennifer and Chi Miigwech, um, Danny, Tasha and Dallas for such a wonderful conversation this evening. It's really um, just energizing. I feel really like motivated just to do something now. Um, I was tired before, but now I'm just like jazzed up. So thank you for sharing your um, your work with all of us and I really heard some, some good gems this evening from you all. Um, lots of energy and collaborative work around indigenous wealth starts with us, starts with our hearts and our, our work that we do with our family and it extends, you know, that ripple effect into our communities and um, how we take care of each other. And those are really important things that I, I heard about all of the work that you're, you're doing. And so that is healing and all of that work does um, all funnel into the future in building ecosystems that help our people thrive and help our people be healthy from the inside out. So I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing. And thank you so much for, um, again, sharing your, your experiences with us tonight. Um, and if you've learned, if you've joined us this evening and you learned something, again, consider making a donation or a contribution to Native Governance Center. We did drop some links in to the chat um, for the organizations that our panelists are from. Consider donating to their work and supporting them in all that they do as well. And we'd like to hear from you if you joined us this evening. We have a survey for our Zoom attendees. We'll post a link into the Facebook comments as well. And we'd love to hear uh, from, from you on this event and things you'd like to see in the future. Um, we plan to do some more events like this in 2022. And so you can follow us on our social media and follow us on our website. But until then, have a wonderful rest of Indigenous Peoples Day, celebrate the work that these people are doing every day and have a really great evening. Thank you all. <laughs>